Welcome back to Mind Your Own Business. Today, in continuing our study of marketing, we're going to look at product mix decisions and new product planning. We'll look at those fairly quickly, although we won't be as rushed as we have been on some things. But, as usual, before we do that, we do have a couple little housekeeping items to take care of. The first of those is our news you can use. The Exporters Incubator now conducts a correspondence course for individuals who want to become exporters and importers. Individuals who complete the 12-week training program will be awarded a certificate of certification by the International Association for Business Organizations. Unlike graduates of other international trade training programs, certified international traders graduate, graduate into a trader's network. This network allows them to attach to an agency for additional importing and exporting assistance. Now they have here a list of new certified international trainers who completed the home training program in 1996. It's a fairly short list. Everyone who takes the CIT program is not awarded the certificate of certification. You do have to complete it. Uh, Now, I thought there was something here about for more information, but apparently I managed to, to uh, delete that from the file somehow. Uh, <laughs> so, if you want to know more about this thing, and let me point out, one, two, three, four people in 1996 managed to get this, the certificate of certification. So, as you know, it's not an easy course to get through, but if you want to try it, if you're interested in import and export, and you want to take a look at this correspondence course, drop me an email or drop me a line, and you'll see contact information off and on throughout the show right here on the screen in uh, this side, lower corner. <laughs> drop me a line or zip me an email or uh, visit the website and use the uh, mind your own business questions and comments form <laughs> I'll get that information for you now having covered that we also have one other little housekeeping item to handle before we get into product mix and new product development, and that is our shareware review. Once again, shareware downloaded from Small Business Administration's website, although I've also seen this particular program on, uh, I believe it was on shareware.com, may have been download.com, one of the two. <coughs> Pardon me. And it's one of those things that's useful in budgeting, if nothing else. It's called Electric Bill Organizer and Planner. Welcome once again to Shareware Review. What you're seeing in front of you is Electric Bill Organizer and Planner. We downloaded this from the Small Business Administration's website. It's intended to help you figure out or predict what your electric bills will be in your place of business or even in your home. The way that it does this, you have a block here where you can put in any minimum charge that the electric company has. And for those of us who live in Montana, I don't know if Montana Power has such a thing or not, you can put in the cost per kilowatt hour here and this will give you the electric cost based on the number of kilowatt hours you end up totaling up down here. And the way that works, in each of these lines you put in an item, you put in the watts that it operates, the hours per day you run it, the number of days in a month you run it, and then it'll come out with the total used for that particular item. Now if there are surcharges for certain items, you can put the cost per hour over here 
or cost per day. Well, they will calculate those too. But at any rate, for instance, and we already have the cursor flashing in the first line. Let's say that you have a computer, a simple tab on your keyboard. We'll put you over here. Let's say that your computer draws 100 watts and you run it 12 hours a day and you run it 21 days per month. Now, what you have is, as you will see here, it costs you then 0.46 cents per hour to run that computer, 11 cents per day, based on 12 hours per day, 100 watt draw at 9.2767 cents per kilowatt hour, which is the cost we have up here. You have, since we show a $5 minimum charge and this adds 234, then you would have a total electric bill of 734 with just that one appliance. Now you can continue to add appliances. A refrigerator that burns 300 watts and is on 24 hours a day, 31 days out of the month, <laughs> for example, costs you 67 cents a day, 2.78 cents per hour to run, and your electric bill has just gone up to 2804 with the minimum charge still being added in. Now, if we get rid of the minimum charge, then of course you're going to come down some. <laughs> in fact, you're going to come down to the 2304 that is totaled up here. Now, I've just managed to erase this just by tabbing through. <laughs> so that was great. All right, so. Let's back up a little here. We ran the computer 21 days. We run the refrigerator 31 days. And there's that. And now, as you can see, it's 2304, which is just what the two appliances add up to. You would put, of course, the lights and all the various things in here. And it would help you plan out what your electric bill is going to cost you. There is also a version of this for water bills, and I believe one for gas bills. Unfortunately, I tried to download the one for water bills, and it didn't download properly. The actual program comes from a company in Tucson, Arizona, and this ELOV1, that's just the electric planner. <laughs> As you can see, it's really expensive register, a whole two dollars. It could save you that on your electric bills just by a little bit of being able to plan and manage in very short order. I think it would be well worth your time and trouble to look into the electric bill organizer and planner as well as its companion for water bills and I believe as I said that there's a companion for, for gas bills. It could be a real money saver in the long run. So what is product mix, anyway? Well, product mix, just very simply stated, is product lines and individual products available from a specific marketer. For example, if you go to specific marketer uh, vans, they have certain product lines, certain individual products that they make available. That is their product mix. If you go to Future Shop, you'll find a different product mix. You'll find some of the same products, you'll find some different. But overall, you'll find a different product mix. If you're buying from Coca-Cola, they have a soft drink line. In within that soft drink line are several soft drink sub lines and even some individual offerings. If you go to Pepsi, they won't have any of those. But they will have soft drink lines, soft drink sub lines, individual offerings within the sub lines almost all competitive with something Coke has. But 
at the same time, different, completely different products, completely different product mix. Now, in assessing your current product mix, there's a few things you need to look at. First of all is where is there room for a line extension? What do we mean by a line extension? A line extension would be a product, an individual product, or several individual products, whatever, that appeal to different market segments that are, re, uh, that are still closely related to an existing product line. Now, an example of this. There was, I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but there was a point there where Kmart was introducing certain celebrity named clothing lines. Now these lines were still closely related to Kmart's day-to-day -day clothing business, but they were appealing to a different market segment. They were extending a line in that they were extending their clothing line with this sub-line, if you will. But they were appealing to different market segments. Usually these were intended to appeal to people whose shopping tastes were slightly upscale of Kmart's normal fare. M&M Mars did the same thing with the M&M line. They have experimented with new areas, for instance. They, I don't know if they're still around even or not, but I was living in Dallas when it was one of the test market cities for the almond M&Ms. Now these were intended to try to cross over some of the people who were eating the Hershey's bars with almonds. <laughs> they did in fact do it. They did help. Now, besides line extension, the other thing that you really have to look at and be very, very careful of in assessing your product mix is cannibalization. What do we mean? A product that takes sales away from another offering in the same line. You see, when Kmart was coming in with these the celebrity label clothes. They were looking for a more upscale market, slightly. They were not looking to take away from their discount clothing business. When M&M Mars came out with almond M&Ms, they didn't want to rob from their sales of peanut M&Ms to sell the things. They were hoping to get some crossovers from Hershey's with almonds and Almond Joy. And this they did. But there's go there probably will be a certain amount of cannibalization in any line extension. The thing is, is it gaining you market? Or are you just stagnating, robbing your market for this product for, to, to give it to that product? In which case, you're actually hurting yourself in the long run, unless the product you're cannibalizing from was on the decline, and the product that that is gaining the market from this is in a growth or even new or even introductory phase. Now product lines, as differentiated from just a product, have some, well, four very important features. First of all, if you only have one product, you have very limited growth potential. This is what Apple Computer found out. They had one product, the Apple II. They've always been kind of a one product company. They've never really diversified into anything else. Oh, they 
made peripherals to go with their computers. But one of Apple's biggest problems is that they've never had a line. They've always had a product and maybe some accessory products to go with that product, but never a true line. And as a result, their growth potential has been ser seriously limited. Now, had they had as, okay, one of the absolute geniuses in this area has been Dell Computer. Dell has always had something for everybody, pretty much. Well, they've never had something for the Mac user or the Apple user because Apple made that all proprietary, which is another area where I think Apple made a mistake. But <laughs> at any rate, Dell has something that's fairly entry level for the home user. They've got something a little more upscale for the small business user or the real serious home user. They've got something for the really, truly serious computer hobbyist. They've got something for bigger businesses. They've got network servers. They've got internet servers. And, you know, they have a line. You don't go to Dell saying, well, let's see, I want to know, what, what is it I want here? Do I want a Power Mac or do I want a Power Mac? You go to Apple, that's basically your choice at any given time. One computer with maybe two or three things that can be changed about it. You go to Dell, you've got a line. Well, do you want Pentium or 686, or would you rather have AMD, you know, uh, which is a Pentium equivalent, basically? Uh, and if, you, if it's Pentium, is it Pentium, Pentium 2, or Pentium MMX? Uh, <laughs> how, many, how much RAM do you want? How big a hard drive do you want? What kind of video do you want? What kind of, do you want an audio card? What kind of modem do you want? It's on and on and on. They have a line and a long one. As a result, Dell has grown like crazy, while Apple has had on again, off again, and been in trouble most of the time. Also, by having a product line, you optimize the use of company resources. You also increase the firm's importance in the market. Here again, you can't ignore Dell Computer. If you're in the computer market, you can't say, well, you know. with Apple, all you've got to do is say, well, these people have said they want a PC format. Apple's out. That's one competitor gone because the Mac is not a PC format. But Dell isn't gone. And they will bid. If you go out to the university and look in their computer labs, most of them are Dell computers. Because they have a contract with Dell because Dell bid. And Dell bid good. Also, by having a product line, you exploit the product life cycle. We talked last time about finding new users finding new use sets, making use more frequent. Well, if you have a product line, now, uh, Arm & Hammer baking soda, for instance. Uh, I forget the name of the company that actually makes them. But <laughs> Arm & Hammer baking soda. They found new uses, extended the product life. Soon, Arm & Hammer baking soda wasn't a product. It was a product line. Arm & Hammer toothpaste, Arm & Hammer deodorant, you know, all these things that stemmed from new uses of the, of the base product, baking soda, bicarbonate of soda. <laughs> now, finally, we have new product planning or product development. Now, you can take a product positioning strategy where you try to change the consumer's perceptions of a product's attributes, uses, quality, and advantages. You can take a market development strategy, find new markets for existing products, 
You could take product development strategy, which creates new products to introduce into existing markets. This is where the Arm & Hammer line has done very well. They've actually developed new products to, to introduce into existing markets. People were brushing their teeth with bicarbonate of soda long before there was Arm & Hammer toothpaste. People were using bicarbonate of soda for deodorant by you know, just kind of dusting it under their arms long before there was Arm & Hammer deodorant. People were using Arm & Hammer baking soda to, to deodorize their refrigerators, and then Arm & Hammer came up with not new product, but new packaging, which is a change in the product, and basically a new product, to introduce into the existing market. You say, but wasn't that cannibalizing? No. It was making it attractive to people who were on the fringe of that market. Finally, you can take a product diversification strategy develop new products for new markets. That's the toughest one. To develop a new product, you'll go through six steps. You'll generate ideas. You'll screen those ideas to see which ones will work and which ones won't. You'll analyze for the ones that pass the screening, the market potential, the growth rates, and the likely competitive strengths. Develop the product in usually a prototype format or limited run. Test market the product. I had talked about M&M Mars test marketing the almond M&Ms in Dallas. And then you'll commercialize the product, which means the wider distribution, after you're sure that it will work. That will then bring us to our Because You Asked segment, and it's interesting that we're talking about marketing. And here we have a question on advertising, which after all is the promotional part of marketing, or part of the promotional part of marketing, anyway. So we'll take a look at this. And our question says, I'm reassessing my advertising plan to try to get a better return on my advertising investment. My market is fairly narrow, local, and fairly affluent. What media would you suggest, and how should I structure the message? Well, to start with, you have a narrow market, you say, that's fairly affluent and very much local. As a result, I don't know that I would use shotgun approach advertising. In other words, if you're going to use television, I would not go buy rotators from anybody. I'd buy guaranteed placement per program knowing the demographics of the viewers. Same thing with radio. I would not buy ROS, run a station. I would buy specific programs where the demographics are known and where you know that it's your market listening. If you're going to use the Missoulian, and that might be a very good choice for you, but I would find out what sections my market read, and I'd go guaranteed section or even guaranteed page, even though that's a premium rate. Whatever media you use, you're going to have to realize, you're going to have to pay the premium to go to the narrower market. There's no sense in paying a lower price if the people seeing your message most of the time aren't part of your market. I mean, let's face it, one of the best buys in television advertising is to go down to TCI cable and buy cable ads. But, caveat, if your market's narrow and your market mostly watches CNN Financial Network, 
and you don't pay extra and get guaranteed that your ads are going to be on CNN Financial Network, every time that ad shows on MTV, which is something your market doesn't watch at all, every time it shows on Nickelodeon, which is something your market doesn't watch at all, that's a waste of money. How many wasted ads do you have to have to make up the difference in the premium cost of making sure none of your ads are wasted. So with a narrower market like yours, you're going to have to be very careful not just what media you use, but how you use it. Here again, now if you were in a larger metropolitan area, they would have probably certain magazines that were mostly read by the affluent. Uh, for instance, in the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex, you have Dallas Living. And that's part of a series of magazines that are published in almost every major city in Texas. And those are read by the more affluent people. So those would be a good media for you because they're localized, their audience is affluent, and your narrower market is going to be part of that. But in Missoula, you don't have that. In Bismarck, as far as I know, you don't have that. You know, in uh, wherever else this show may be. <laughs> in the Northwest, we just don't have that, except maybe in Seattle and Portland and possibly Spokane. So, well, maybe Omaha, because Northwest Business Development does also serve Nebraska. But <laughs> as a result, you don't have that kind of a media to choose, so you're going to have to judiciously use the available media. As far as structuring your message, that depends on what you want your message to do, what it's possible for your message to do which depends in a large amount on your product or service, and you didn't give me quite as much information as I'd need for that. If you're a real high-priced product or high-priced service, though, uh, or something that's not needed really often, maybe you want to sell your company name instead of your product or service. If you're lower priced, more used more often, maybe you sell a product or service with your company name more as an afterthought. Next week we talk about marketing services. Now not marketing services like ad agencies, but marketing of services. Till then, just mind your own business. <laughs>